Well, good morning. It's great to be with you uh, this morning. As Matt has said, my name is Tim, and we get to dig into this topic together in just a moment. Why don't you join me? Uh, I'm going to ask God to help us as we do that together. Father, we pray that you uh, would give us clarity around the answers that we can give and humility around the areas where we kind of reach the edge, edge of or the end of where answers are possible. Lord, we're entering a topic um, which is painful for many of us, where right now we might be hurting because we're bruised, we're broken. We might be crying out why. We pray maybe that you give some answers, but ultimately that you give us confidence that we can trust you. Because even if we're not always sure why, we can trust that you know why. And so I pray that you would help uh, what I say now to be helpful for all of us to give us confidence that you are good, that you're powerful, and that you're working out all things for our good and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, as you maybe kind of picked up from the prayer this morning, I have the intimidating responsibility of trying to give a Christian response to the problem of evil and suffering. And so I suppose I just want to begin by acknowledging what hopefully is obvious but that is that evil and suffering are a problem because they wreak absolute havoc in our world and in our personal lives every day. When I think about the world, what we've got to do is just cast your mind to any number of the horrible tragedies that have ripped through our world in recent history. Like maybe your mind goes to the Boxing Day tsunami, killed, I think it was 233,000 people. Uh, there was the earthquake in Haiti, 160,000 people or the various acts of genocide over the years, whether it was the Nazis in World War II or more recently in Rwanda in 1994. There's the ongoing death from terror attacks, September 11, Paris, it seems to happen every day in places like Africa and the Middle East. Or if we step a little closer to home, in Australia on average, one woman every week is murdered by her partner or her ex-partner. In Australia, one in six girls, one in nine boys are sexually assaulted before the age of 15. Evil and suffering wreaks absolute havoc in our world. But it's not just in the world outside, it's also in our personal lives. And so you might be here this morning asking questions like, you know, why did I get that diagnosis? Why did I lose that loved one? Why did I get born with this condition, suffer that betrayal, experience that abuse? Evil and suffering wreaks havoc in our personal lives as well. And so, as I said, I want to state the obvious. Evil and suffering is a problem. But as we say that, it's important to recognize that it's a different kind of problem for people in the room. And I think it's at least two kinds. Because on the one hand, you might kind of encounter this problem purely from an intellectual perspective. Uh, perhaps you're here and you're a skeptic. Welcome, it's so great to have you. But maybe for you, you look at some of the things I've just identified, particularly out there in the world, and you think, that is evidence that a good and all-powerful God could not possibly exist. Or maybe you're here as a believer, uh, and you, know, you believe that a good and all-powerful God does exist, the God of the Bible, but uh, you've got friends or family members that don't. And maybe today, out of this talk, you're hoping to get some answers so that you can give the smackdown answer to them. For you, this is an intellectual question, pondered, if you like, from the safety of your armchair from the safety of the armchairs, you sit back and you think, why do bad things happen to good people? And there's nothing wrong with thinking about it in that way, but I, I suppose I want to be up front and say, while some of us might ask the question like that from the safety of the armchair, others will ask it from the wheelchair. And that is, you might be here and have experienced horrible pain and suffering personally, and so maybe you used to be a believer, but then something happened. And it tore your life apart. And now you've found yourself with the conclusion that the good and all-powerful God of the Bible can't exist. Or at least if he does, I don't want anything to do with it. Or maybe you're here as a believer and you do trust in this good and all-powerful God, but frankly, you're just hurting. And so the question that we asked this morning is one asked through real tears, with real wounds, some of which are very fresh right now. Uh, personally, it's kind of a combination of both for me. Um, 
I am sort of drawn to the intellectual side of things. Uh, last year, I, I got to have a conversation with someone over the course of the year who began the year as a skeptic and finished the year as a believer, which was really exciting. Uh, but for him, the key intellectual, so it was a philosophical discussion, the key obstacle to him coming to faith was this problem. You know? And so over the course of the year, particularly kind of uh, February, March, April, we, we had a number of intellectual discussions about this problem. I found them stimulating. It's not just an intellectual conversation or issue, if you like, for me. Last week, it's also personal. Last week, I ran the first funeral that I've ever had to run. I suspect it's the first of many. And so death is real. I haven't suffered, frankly, that much personally, but I know many of you have. As your pastor, you tell me or I hear about it. And so we've got people I know in the room or at the previous service dealing with the loss of a loved one. We've got marriages in breakdown. We've got unwanted addictions. We've got people struggling with infertility or miscarriages. Just wrestling and trying to survive through chronic pain or mental illness or experienced abuse in our past, maybe ongoing. And so I suppose that as we come to this question, the problem of evil and suffering, I suppose that it's a live issue. I'm dealing with live ammo this morning. And so as we move forward, I want to if you keep it like, flag up front that what I'm going to say, some parts of what I say will be more helpful for some of us than others. Right? Different parts may grab you more than others. But that's because we come at it from different angles. It could be that you're in the midst of it right now and nothing I say is going to be helpful. Maybe all you need is some friends and family to sit with you and cry. But I, I want to try and at least give something helpful um, to those of us in the room. So what I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say three things. I want to begin by at least helping us appreciate that, yes, evil and suffering is a problem for the Christian, but it's not only a Christian problem. Now, that's the first thing I want to do. Next, I want to give at least an attempt at a brief Christian response to the problem of evil and suffering. And then I'll finish, and this will take place pretty quickly, I want to try and give you some resources if you're in the middle of evil and suffering right now. Right? So, first of all, it's not just a Christian problem. Second of all, a brief response from a Christian perspective. And then third, some resources. So let's jump in. Um, first of all, the problem of evil and suffering is not just a Christian problem. It's important that we kind of understand that from the beginning. It's a problem for everyone. And so I'll give you three examples, three case studies, if you like. The first is New Age spirituality. Now, you may not be heaps familiar with it, but New Age spirituality borrows a lot from pantheistic and Eastern religions. And it basically teaches that evil and suffering, or particularly suffering, suffering is what they call maya, or which just means an illusion. And so the idea is that through meditation and prayer, you can reach enlightenment. And enlightenment is almost like a cosmic consciousness. Because pantheism means everything is gone. So you, you tap into the cosmic consciousness where you come to appreciate that evil and suffering is a maya. It's just an illusion. Now, I don't know about you, but solving a problem but de by denying the existence of a problem seems to create more problems. When Emma and I uh, were engaged, she's my wife, and we were doing marriage prep, someone said to us, you know, Tim, particularly to me, said, Tim, if Emma has a problem and she's upset, don't rush too quickly to try and solve the problem because that'll create more problems. Instead, just try and listen at the very first. Now, I haven't always been wise enough to obey that advice. When I have, it's typically, typically been the right move. But even I know that trying to solve Emma's problems by denying that she has a problem is just going to create more problems. Right? That's what New Age spirituality does. It says evil and suffering it's just an illusion. It doesn't exist, which I think personally creates more problems. That's the first example. The second is karmic religions, like Hinduism, for example, because these uh, basically teach that suffering is the result of karma. And so karma, what is it? It's like an um, invisible force of, or an impersonal force of justice, such that if you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. If you do good things, good things will happen to you. Often kind of in, in your next life, you know, there's a cycle of uh, birth and rebirth that goes on. So that's the way that they'll respond. But the problem with this is that in karmic religions, it tends to flip kindness and cruelty on its head. 
Because think about it, if you walk through the street and you see someone who is suffering, maybe they're starving or something like that, there's something within you, I suspect, that thinks, oh, I should care for this person. I should be kind to them by caring for them. But in karmic religions, that's actually cruelty because what you're doing, according to karmic religions, is preventing karma from doing its work on this person. And so you're forcing them to be reborn in an even worse situation next time around. And so it flips kindness and cruelty on its head. And so the problem here with karma is that it basically legitimizes suffering as your just deserves. You deserve to experience this. And it also um, tries to uh, discourage you from seeking to alleviate other people's suffering. And so that, I think, is a problem as well. All of which leads us to the third and final just example up front, which is atheism. And I would suggest that atheism, the problem here, is that it tends to spend so long pointing at everyone else's problems that it fails to recognise some of its own problems when it comes to this area of evil and suffering. And so on the screen is going to come a quite a common way that an atheist, not all atheists, um, but an atheist might phrase the objection, at least to the Christian God. Take a look. It says, a good and all-powerful God would not allow evil and suffering to exist. But evil and suffering do exist. Therefore, if God is able to end evil and suffering, but he chooses not to, he must not be good. Or if he wants to end evil and suffering, but he's not able to, then he must not be all-powerful. Either way, the good and all-powerful God of the Bible doesn't exist. That's a fairly common way of phrasing this objection, at least from an atheist's point of view. That's worth knowing. It's not an original observation. Uh, as you'll see on the screen, two faces will come up. Uh, it was first made, this observation, not exactly in these terms, but uh, by a guy named Epicurus in the 2nd and 3rd century BC. It was then kind of restated and probably slightly more popularised by a guy named David Hume in the 18th century AD. But it's a fairly common objection that you might be aware of and you might have even heard. But here's the thing. What you want to be aware of is that this objection, I think, is really just a smokescreen designed to distract you away from noticing some of the core problems within atheism. And I want to try and show you why I think it's a flawed smokescreen. The second will deal with the problem of atheism to begin with, but the first just points out the weakness of the objection to begin with. You see, the objection assumes that all suffering is pointless. Notice the first line. A good and all-powerful God would not allow evil and suffering to exist. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like an arrogant claim, doesn't it? Because just because you can't think of a good reason for suffering to exist doesn't mean that it, there is no good reason. And so it seems like it's suggesting that all suffering is pointless, but that seems like a, an assumption that's unproved. And we can move on, thanks. But this is quite helpfully uh, illustrated by a guy named Alvin Plantinga. Uh, he's quite a famous apologist, and he uses this out illustration about no -seums. If you haven't heard of those, don't worry, neither had I. They're basically tiny, tiny little flies, like sand flies, with a very powerful bite. And Alvin Plantinga is like, imagine you're in, the, uh, you're in the countryside and I asked you to look inside my tent and come and have a look and tell me, can you see any St. Bernard's in there? A dog, like a big dog. And he says, I would have every reason to trust your response because a St. Bernard is the kind of thing I would expect you to be able to see inside my tent. But suppose I asked you, tell me, are there any no inside my tent? He follows it up by saying, look, I've actually then got no reason to trust your response. After all, you can't see them. Right? No see -ems, they're small, so no see -ems, that's why they're called no see -ems. But here's his point. The problem with the atheist is that it tends, they tend to assume that if there are reasons for God to allow evil and suffering, they would be more like St. Bernard's than no see -ems. But that's just an unproved assumption. You can't prove that there could well be very, very good reasons for why God, who is all-powerful and good, might allow evil and suffering to exist. It's just that we can't see it. And so the first problem of this kind of uh, critique, if you like, is that it's arrogant and assumes that there aren't any good reasons. 
But the second problem is that it can't actually hold up. It sort of collapses under its own weight. And we'll see on the slide a quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis here is going to critique his own thinking back when he was an atheist. So listen to what he says. He says, My argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how have I got this idea of just and unjust? What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Now, of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. And so Lewis says, becomes a believer and says, consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. Thanks for the slide. What Lewis is basically saying here is that when people, from an atheistic perspective, make the kind of the critique, you know, um, a good and all-powerful God wouldn't allow suffering, it's usually done with the assumption, or if you'd like, with a sense of justice, that, that people shouldn't suffer, that people shouldn't die, that people shouldn't die of starvation or be abused or be raped or murdered. But Lewis says, where do you get that idea from? Because natural selection says that the death of the weak, whether through starvation or through violence from the strong, is just natural. And so... If everything in the universe is really just a combination of random chance and uh, all the species comes about through natural selection, then how can we say that suffering is unjust, that it's evil? Because according to the atheist framework, there's no such thing as justice in the first place. And so something can't be unjust, therefore. And so Lewis's point is the whole uh, problem sort of just collapses in on itself. All I'm trying to do here is just help us appreciate, yes, and we're going to deal with it. Evil and suffering is a big problem for a Christian. But it's not only a problem for the Christian. It's a problem for everyone. It's a problem if you're New Age, if you're from karmic religion, or if you're an atheist as well. And so the question you've got to ask is not, all right, which worldview out there doesn't have a problem when it comes to this area? What you've got to ask is which worldview gives you the most compelling response and the most powerful resources for dealing with this problem, because it's real. What I want to do now, uh, if that's kind of point one, is in this second point, just give a brief, and it will be brief, a Christian response to the problem of evil and suffering. And as we do, it's important, I think, to, to lay out the boundary markers. You know, what's the playing field on which we're allowed to play this game, the Christian response? And I say that because the Bible makes a number of different um, claims about truth. But three are very important for this conversation. Number one, God is good. Number two, God is all-powerful. Number three, evil and suffering exist. Right? We find those three truths very difficult to hold together at the same time. That's why it's a problem. But the Bible makes them clear. God is good. He's also all-powerful. And yet at the same time, evil and suffering exist. And so as we move forward, you should know... We may struggle, in fact, we won't get all the answers to our questions, we won't. But if we're going to give a Christian response, we have to stay within those boundary markers. And we may come up with a great, what we think is a great solution, but if it crosses one of those boundary markers, it's no longer a Christian response, and I'm going to suggest it's no longer actually a good response, because I think the best response will come from when we hang out in those boundary markers. So within those boundaries, what can we say? Well, I want to say two things. According to the Bible, all evil and suffering is the result of sin. Say it again. According to the Bible, all evil and suffering is the result of sin. And so the Bible begins, right, Genesis chapter 1. It makes it very clear that God creates the world good. And if you miss that, he says it seven times in the first chapter. God created the world and he saw that it was good. It was good. It was good. Seven times. But then in chapter 3 everything falls to pieces. Because in chapter 3, uh, our first parents, Adam and Eve, disobey God, and then sin enters the world with devastating consequences. And so as a result of sin, you start to get hostility between humanity and God, hostility between humanity itself, so all of a sudden you get to 
Uh, for the first time, you have deceit and lying and slander and murder and rape as people start to turn on one another. But then you also get hostility, if you like, between creation and humanity. And so, according to the Bible, uh, the curse is actually a fruit of human sinfulness. And so you'll see on the slide, uh, Paul in Romans 8, 20 to 22 says, For the creation, like the universe, if you like, was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And so Paul's effectively saying, when you look, thanks, when you look at something like the Boxing Day tsunami, or Hurricane Katrina, Cyclone Tracy, or some drought that actually absolutely devastates an entire population, you say, that's not right. The Bible says, you're right. It's not right. God didn't create the world like that. He created it good. Evil and suffering is a result of sin. Having said that, uh, let me qualify what I mean when I say evil and suffering is the result of sin. Uh, let's clarify the relationship between sin and suffering. And you've got to hear this, uh, particularly uh, last service, someone you know, asked a question that was basically to the effect, commenting on the fact that Job's friends all give really bad advice uh, and basically just hurt him. And that's because they had a bad theology. Right? If you want to give good advice, if you want to provide good care for someone who's suffering, you need to have a good theology of the relationship between sin and suffering. So let me give that to you quickly. First thing to say is sometimes, yes, some suffering is a direct result of your own specific sin. Some suffering is a direct result of your own specific sin. So, for example, if you try to be a champion, you go to the bar, you drink 20 beers, you get behind a wheel, you drive your car and you smash into a pole and then you become a paraplegic, your suffering is a result of your sin. On the other hand, some people suffering as a direct result of another person's sin. So if someone tries to be a champion, goes to the bar, drinks 20 beers, they get behind a wheel, and this time they don't hit a pole, but they hit you, then your suffering is a result of their sin. Right? Some suffering that we experience is a direct, specific result of someone else's sin. But the third and really important thing for you to hear is that while all suffering is a result of sin, not all suffering is linked to a specific personal sin. And you see this really clearly in a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. Take a look in 1 John, sorry, in John chapter 9, verse 1 to 3. It says, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And so his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so the disciples are looking at this guy born blind, and they're like, Jesus, whose fault was it? Like, did the guy sin? You know, was he like a real bad kid in utero? Uh, and so he just gave his mum really bad morning sickness, or his kicks were a little bit too hard, and so God punishes him by making him born blind? Or maybe, were his parents, like, sinful, and so... Was he the product of divorce, uh, sorry, not divorce, of adultery or something? And so um, this kid being born was sort of like punishment with a disability to his parent. Is that what's going on? Jesus says, no, no, no. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. And so what Jesus is effectively saying here is that you cannot, the Bible won't allow you to look at someone with suffering, right? If someone is sick, they've got cancer. Uh, if someone is suffering severe mental illness, if someone is a victim of an attack or a natural disaster, the Bible won't allow you to look at that person and say, you're suffering because you're sinful, or you don't have enough faith. And that's karma, that's not Christianity. Yes, all suffering is the result of sin, but not all suffering is a direct result of a specific sin. So firstly, what can we say within these parameters? Well, we're first of all saying that the Bible teaches that all suffering is a result of sin. So you might say, okay, well, I get why it's in the world. It's because of sin. But why does God allow it to happen? Right? If he's all-powerful and he's good, why does evil and suffering still take place? 
Well, that is kind of the second uh, thing I think we can say from a Christian perspective, a Christian response, if you like. And that is that um, we touched on this a little bit before with the no seem idea, but the Bible and lots of people's personal testimony will testify to the fact that God is able to bring great good out of evil and suffering, both on a personal point of view and also for many others. We'll deal with the personal first and then we'll draw it more broadly. See, take a look at what Malcolm Mugridge uh, says of kind of looking back on his life. He's a famous uh, atheist turned Christian journalist of the last century. He says, contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I've learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has, listened to this, truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness where the pursuit or attained. In other words, if it were to be possible to eliminate affliction from our earthly existence by means of some drug or other medical mumbo jumbo, the result would not be to make life delectable but to make it too banal or trivial to be endurable. But notice what he says. He doesn't simply say that because I suffered, you know, God is so powerful that he was enabled, he sort of enabled me to grow through those difficult experiences. He actually goes further than that and says that some of my growth, or if you like, some good in the world, actually wouldn't have been possible were it not for the pain and suffering that I experienced. It's very interesting. If you take a look at uh, the next slide, Paul, the apostle, basically says a similar thing 2,000 years ago, which is that in Romans 5, 3 to 4, we glory in our suffering. Glory just means rejoice in this context. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character. Hope. Paul knows that suffering builds character and therefore he can rejoice in it now. Honestly, I don't think we've ever rejoiced in our sufferings. But Emma and I, my wife, we've been married for 10 years. We've had some pretty good highs, but there have been some pretty brutal lows. Uh, some of those have been the result of my sin, her sin. Some of it's been the result of other people's sin. We've never rejoiced. But now, looking back, we would both testify to the fact that our marriage is a heck of a, heck of a lot stronger now than because of those tough times. And so, both the scriptures and personal experience seem to suggest that God actually can bring really good things out of pain and suffering, evil and suffering. But he doesn't just do it for the individual, because what I want to say now is he also can bring good out of an individual suffering for many people. And the great biblical example of this, well, there's an even better one, but one I'll show you now, is Joseph. Right? I read the story of Joseph in my devotions this week. If you don't know the story, it's like, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. It's not quite like that, but it's based on that story. Right, so Joseph is a guy, he's got 12 brothers, or 11 brothers, he's one of 12, but he's also a little bit arrogant, and so his brothers decide one day that he's gotten a little too big for his boots, and so they sell him into slavery. Now, as a result of that, that's brotherly love right there, as a result of that, he ends up in an Egyptian prison. That's kind of the low point. But then, through this incredible hand of providence, a number of things happen for him to come out the other side, if you like, from pit to palace, right through to the end, where he's made prime minister of Egypt, second in charge in the whole country. He's put in charge of the collection and distribution of grain during seven years of famine and seven years of plenty, with the result that through his sort of administration, um, Thousands of people are able to survive that would have died from starvation if it weren't for that. And so uh, a couple of years afterwards, you know, after he's been reconciled with his brothers that sold him into slavery, he saved all these people through giving him grain. Take a look at what he says to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20. Saying to the brothers, he says, You intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And so Joseph is able to look at this horrible experience. He spent years in prison. He suffered incredible betrayal, all sorts of injustice. And yet he looks back on his life and he can tell you, if God didn't allow me to experience that suffering and pain and betrayal, 
then I wouldn't have been able to be the agent of justice and salvation that I have been now. And so you intended it for evil, but God was right there at the same time intending it and working all things for good for the salvation of many. And so what we learn from Joseph, therefore, is that God cannot just use good things to grow us, but he can also use suffering, uh, bad things to grow us, but he can also use suffering to actually bring great good in the lives of many people. But that now brings us to what I want to say is probably the biggest Christian, sorry, the biggest problem with the Christian response. It's the pointy end, if you like. Because you might be sitting here going, all right, conceptually, if you want to play the philosophical game for a moment, I can understand conceptually that God can bring good out of evil and suffering. Yeah, that makes sense. But still, you boil it all down. And we've got a big problem, and that is that Christianity says that there are good reasons for innocent people to suffer. There are good reasons for innocent people to suffer. I suspect many of us will find that something of a bitter pill to swallow. Because maybe you look at something like the Boxing Day tsunamis, and you think 233,000 people died. Okay. Maybe some of them were evil and deserved it. But in that many people, you probably got some of them who were innocent. Why did they get it? What good could possibly come from that? You think about the rape and murder of a teenage girl. What good could possibly come from something like that? Surely some things are so evil that no good is worth allowing them to happen. Aren't something so evil that no good could possibly be worth allowing it to happen? But yeah, maybe I, if I maybe if I could understand the good, then I could trust God. But frankly, right now, looking at some of the stuff in the world, He looks like a vindictive, cruel monster. I think that's the core of the Christian problem. And so, what do we say to it? Well, the first thing to acknowledge is that the Bible doesn't give us all the answers. It, it doesn't tell us every reason. It gives us the principle, right? God can bring good out of suffering, but it doesn't give us the specific answers. And so you might be in the middle of something right now where you're looking around and you've got no idea what good could possibly come from this. Right? You're looking at a relationship and you're thinking to yourself, I do not feel stronger. I don't feel like I've got better character as a result of this. I lost 12 years of my life. I feel bruised and battered. What good could possibly come from this? The Bible says, honestly, this side of heaven, we may not be able to look back and see all the good that God works through things. We just might not. So it doesn't give us all the answers. It doesn't give us the reasons. But what it does do, and I need you to hear this, it does give us the reason for the worst evil and suffering that has ever taken place. For the worst evil and suffering. It gives us that reason. So let's think about that. What is the most evil thing that has ever taken place? What is the most uh, severe act of injustice that has ever happened in the history of the human race? I would suggest it's the death of Jesus Christ. Because he wasn't just blameless and upright. He was sinless and perfect. Right, if there is ever a man who was innocent and didn't deserve to die, didn't deserve to suffer, it was Jesus Christ. But he wasn't just a man. The Bible says he's God in the flesh. He's the Son of God. And you, you know what? He's betrayed, he's whipped, he's stripped naked, and then he's strung up to a Roman cross. What could be more evil than killing the Son of God? That's happened in human history. So that's evil. What about suffering? Well, what, what is the worst possible suffering? Well, I suspect you and I could come up with a few candidates. But if you want the biblical answer, you may not agree with it, but if you want the biblical answer, then you've got to go back to sin. Because remember, what is sin? Well, we said at the start, sin creates hostility between the planet and creation and humans, between humans and humans, but also between humans and God. 
Right? When we reject God, when we rebel against God, when we disobey God, that's sin. And the Bible says that sin against an eternal God carries with it an eternal suffering. And so according to the Bible, there is a suffering worse than rape and murder. There is a suffering worse than death by starvation. There is a suffering worse than death by tsunami. It's an eternal separation from the presence of good and all-powerful God. It's what the Bible calls hell. That's the worst form of suffering that exists. But here's what I want you to see. Because the Bible also says that God allowed the worst form of evil, the death of his son, to deliver people like you and I from the worst form of suffering. Separation from him for all eternity. Take a look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Christ, God in the flesh, the Son of God, suffered. Right? He died on a cross, severe, experiencing the worst possible evil. Because he was righteous. We were unrighteous. But he died to bring us to God. And so when you ask the question, at the core of the Christian problem, how could Christianity possibly say that there are good reasons for the innocent to suffer? Surely some evil, surely no good is worth allowing certain evil to take place. The Bible says, some good is worth even allowing God's son to die. What is it? In this case, it's the salvation of people like you and I. And so, yes, the Bible doesn't give us all the reasons. You might get to the end of life and still be looking back on some brutal experience and have no idea why. But what it does give you is the reason that the worst act of evil and suffering took place. And I'll tell you what, he had good reasons for that. I said, if he had good reasons for that, you've got to trust that he must, even if you can't understand it, have good reasons for all the other things that we just look at and just, why? And so I think that leaves us with a choice. Uh, what kind of God are you going to believe in? I think there's at least four options. Number one, you may choose just to disbelieve in God, right? I'm going to believe that there is no God. And that is often the modern solution to the problem of evil and suffering. It's interesting, it's, it was almost never the ancient solution. You should know that. The ancients almost never decided that because of evil and suffering, they weren't going to believe in God. Apparently, it takes a, a certain degree of modern hubris to imagine that just because we can't imagine good reasons for evil and suffering, there can't be any. Not yet, thanks. But it may be that you decide that that's where you want to land. Say, so, you know, I'm not going to believe in God. I think that probably creates more problems for you than solutions, but you may decide to land there. Second option you could have is that you decide, well, I'm going to believe in a powerless God. Because you see, I realise that in order to have good and evil, God must exist. So he must be good, but he can't be all powerful, because if he was, why is there really evil in the world? Uh, there's a Christian heresy called open theism. You're welcome to explore it if you like. It gets pretty close to that. But I think the problem with that is it leaves you with a God who's impotent and you've got no guarantee that ever good is going to triumph over evil. And so you live just completely uncertain that things are going to turn out all right. Third, and the third option is you could believe in a cruel God. You say, well, he, he must be powerful I and mean, he created the world, but he can't be good because if he were, he wouldn't allow the suffering. Job in the Bible gets close to that. Job is a character in the Bible who is blameless and upright. He's got all the wealth in the world, and yet in one day he loses his family, all his wealth, and then eventually his health. Loses everything. He flirts with the idea that God is a cruel monster who is just delighting and shooting painful arrows at him. Believers, you might go through periods where you're tempted to believe that. Sometimes your experience will make you feel like that is true. But I want to encourage you to opt for the fourth option. And that is to believe in a God, the God of the Bible, who is both good and all-powerful. And who even if you don't know what on earth he is doing, he does. And so you trust 
that is working all things for your good and his glory. And so to finish, I want to encourage you to believe in him and, and then give you three resources that I think the Christian faith gives you if you're in the midst of suffering right now. I'll say again, if you're right in the pit of despair right now, some of what I say now probably won't help. You just need people to come around you and cry with you. But perhaps in preparation for the time where all of us go through evil and suffering, let me offer three resources. First of all, as a Christian, you know why you're not suffering. Right? Even if you don't know why you are suffering, you know why you're not suffering. And that is you know you're not being punished by God. Right? The Bible says that on the cross, Jesus bore the punishment that we deserve. So you're not being punished. You also know it's not that God doesn't care. It's not that God has forgotten about you. No, no, no. He sent his son for you. Take a look at what Paul says in Romans. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Right? If God gave his son for you, it's not that he doesn't care. We don't know why it is, but we know why it's not. He loves you and you can trust him because he gave his son for you. That's the first, if you like, resource. The second is that Christianity gives you a God who knows what it's like to suffer. You know, Christianity is the only God that has scars. Many of us, I think, assume that because Jesus was God in the flesh, he was a little bit like Clark Kent to Superman, you know. Um, he couldn't really feel pain, he just pretended to feel pain. As the nails are going on, he pretends to scream because... But that's not what the Bible says. What the Bible says, he was fully God, but also fully man, and so he knew what it was to suffer. He's been tempted as you and I have been. He suffered even beyond what we have. Take a look at what Atticus Finch says from Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. He says, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into a skin and walk around in it. You know, it's tempting to look up to God and say, God, how would you know what this is like? You know, you created this world, but you're up there in your fancy heaven. You don't get ever stained by this suffering and evil, and you just create this world for us to wallow in. God has stepped into our shoes. He stepped into our skin. He has scars. And so Christianity gives you a God who knows what it's like to suffer. He's been there before you, which means he can walk with you. And most importantly, he can bring you out the other side. Because the third and final resource, if you like, is that of hope. It's the promise of the New Testament about the new creation, where everything is heading. Take a look at the promise that the Bible finishes with, Revelation 21. John, the author, says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying this is a vision of the future. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Right? We don't always know why we suffer. But if you trust in God, you know where you're headed. You're headed to a world where there will be no more evil and suffering. And we won't have an existence where we're without God, but an existence where we're with God for all eternity. No more pain, no more evil. And so because God is good and all-powerful, he's going to bring that about one day. As I close... I just uh, leave you with one final quote, and it's from Samwise Ganji. Right? Samwise Ganji from the Lord of the Rings. At the end of the second Lord of the Rings, he's trying to encourage a Frodo to keep pressing on towards Mount Mordor, and, and he says this: "It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. You know the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. Sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened?" But in the end, it's only a passing shadow. Because even darkness must pass, and a new day will come. When the sun shines, it'll shine out all the clearer. The promise of the Bible, the promise of Christianity, is that one day, maybe not this side of eternity, but one day, there'll be a day when we look back on all the evil and the suffering the things that we're in right now, the things that are going to happen to you in weeks, months, years from now. Things that cause us to ask why, but we'll look back one day and say, ah, the sun shines all the more clearly because of those things. 
Hallelujah. I tried to say this morning, evil and suffering is a massive problem. It's a problem for everyone, for Christians included. But I've also tried to suggest that Christianity, only Christianity, I think gives you enough reason to understand it, but most importantly, the necessary resources to deal with it. And so if you are in a place of suffering right now, can I urge you, encourage you, cling to Christ, trust in him, because he's walked there with you. You know why you're not suffering. It's not that he doesn't care, he loves you. And one day he's going to make all things new. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for not leaving us in the dark. We thank you that you've come and walked in our shoes. You've been where we have and so we can trust you. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Even through that horrible moment of evil, you brought out incredible good. And so I pray that you would help us to trust you. Even when we have no idea what's going on. Thank you that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.